go to space, we see the universe and we turn around and look at our own home and it's all water. It's 70% water, it's the blue planet, the water planet, and I've spent my life going beneath the surface. In fact, if you think about the surface um, of the water, for the two and a half billion, million years that humans have been on this planet, we've looked across, across a surface, across to an endless horizon, and what went on beneath the skin of the sea was out of sight, out of mind, unknown. And as a 12-year-old uh, child or an 8-year-old child in Adirondack Lake, when I put my head beneath the water, everything changed. Well, tell us what this photograph is, where it is. In the Cayman Islands, in the North Sound, uh, there's, a barrier, there's a barrier reef. Stingrays come there. I wanted to make a picture that's half in, half out of the water. It's a signature image that I've always worked on. And uh, here you have the boiling clouds of the Caribbean, the stingray gliding under it on a uh, very hot June afternoon. And the stingray's wing imitates the curve of the water surface. Let's take a look at another. My partner, my wife, who's a marine biologist and photographer, Jennifer Hayes, and I were in the Galapagos uh, during the El Nino episode from 19, uh, 1997 to 1998. The water warmed up. It went from green to blue. The food for this sea lion disappeared in the deeper water, and now it's hunting these silvery salimas. It'll never get its energy back. It's beautiful, but it was a ballet of starvation. You mentioned your wife, Jen, and just to give an example of the kind of life that you two lead, three days ago, we were on East 70th and Fifth <laughs> Avenue in New York talking, and we weren't sure if Jen was going to be able to make it because you had to make a very serious decision. We, one of us, and it was either Jennifer or myself, had to go chase Greenland sharks in Baikamo in the northern uh, bank of the St. Lawrence River for a story that we're working on for Geographic. Uh, time and tide or Greenland sharks wait for nobody. <laughs> how, does your, how does your wife's work as a biologist and how does science play into your decisions and well, how you make a photo? Well, almost every picture, well, to be quite honest, every picture, every idea, sometimes begins in the shower, <laughs> like most everybody else here. Uh, then we decide where we want to go and how we want to approach something. And the first people we go to are scientists. And then you have to translate that into a, a visual medium. This is a gorgeous picture. Silky sharks in Cuba in a place called the Gardens of the Queens. It's an archipelago that is just uh, south, 50 miles south of uh, the uh, southern coast of Cuba, untouched because of, uh, because of the Cold War. You mentioned uh, with the first picture we saw, a signature you have of this over-under water photography. Tell us a little bit about, oh, that, that's a great one. This is an under under. This is under underwater. We'll get to over under. The most this popular place in all of our national parks, most popular beach, is a place called Trunk Bay. It's in the uh, American Virgin Islands in St. Uh, St. John's. And I needed to do a picture there. And I discovered that every step you would attract these tiny pompanet fish that are eating the, all the detritus and everything else you kick up. And I looked at this picture and I poked my head above water and I asked the person who owned the legs if she could get a pedicure and make it red, and that made this image. To pop the picture. Let's see. Here we are. OK. The over-under technique. Tell us a little bit practically how you do this. I think everybody who takes photographs would be interested in that. But also, what you think it tells us about the relationship between terrestrial and underwater. I love, Allison, I love this relationship. And in fact, this is one of the things that really makes me be an underwater photographer, and Jennifer, and then for that matter too, is that there's a difference between the air of world and land and the air of water. It's such a difference that we know very, very little about what goes on beneath. 
But this skin, this molecular, tiny molecular skin, is a doorway to most of our planet. And that's what these pictures do. The funny thing about it is we get a lot of, uh, a lot of people write, email us and say, you know, you're just making up these pictures. You're faking them. You're, you're manipulating them. You're photoshopping them. And they're not. Hmm. They're really not. This is, this is the moment. This is a beautiful moment in the lagoon in French Polynesia. And the light is very important, right? You go into a world that's dark, so everything has to be lit. And what you want to do is not wind up as a paparazzi, cornering a fish in a dark nightclub and giving the sets with a strobe. <laughs> You want to think of yourself as an artiste and, you know, the strobes float around. You have a big underwater camera the size of a microwave, for instance, with two long arms and strobes on there either side. And you have to pretend that, yes, you're a studio photographer balancing the light. Most southern reef in the world. One of the things that you wrote about this underwater and um, uh, air imagery is, you wrote, the bottom line is this. Half and half images are not easy and they take time and concentration, but they used to be worse. The digital camera has made our lives easier with instantaneous feedback. Now we know when to quit and chase a school of fish. Oh. So this brings up two issues, the, the technology and also when do you know when to stop? I mean, with, with this kind, you could go on forever. You could explore and keep going and going. That's the horror of digital photography. You never know when to stop because it always can be improved, and you're seeing things instantly. Uh, we went down the middle of the Red Sea a number of years ago, shot nearly 600 rolls of film. Didn't see them. This is in the day of something called film. Didn't see <laughs> the pictures. Didn't see them for three months. It was photography that I call big casino. <laughs> Your first experiences, when you first started doing this, what did you, what did you hope to accomplish and, and how has that changed over time as you've become more experienced? Initially, what attracts any photographer to anything is this, this sense of mystery, a sense of being able to make a picture in, a, in another world with a palette that's unknown and that's, that's wonderful. And Every dive was a dive of exploration, which still continues. What has changed radically is the fact that we may be recording. Because of global climate change, as the water warms up in coral reefs and all over the world changes everything from the very basic chemistry of the sea, we may be recording a time and a place on our planet that's ultimately beautiful and will ultimately be gone. And we, that's, a, that's, a, that's the Damoclean sword. We talked about this a lot, that you stumble on things that are so beautiful and stunning and sometimes hilarious, but you also find things that are horrifying. So we have a, a couple of pictures that, that show just the difference of things that you find when you go on your explorations. Let's see. Ah. Well, this isn't quite horrifying. This is another moment in time. We're working on a story on uh, National Marine Sanctuaries, and this is in the Florida Keys. We get a call from the rangers. They say two loggerhead turtles are mating. Now, loggerhead turtle mating pictures are relatively rare, and I always wanted to take them, but taking mating turtle pictures is a little like, like bursting into a hotel room uh, and saying, oh, go ahead, keep on doing what you're doing. Don't, don't bother with me. So here we have the uh, male on the top, the female on the bottom, very bored. And I'm shooting this, again, with my big bread box camera. Another other turtle comes swimming up, a very good-looking, dark-haired male, like Rudolf, Rudolf Valentino, dark eyes. And these turtles eat jellyfish, so they can't really see anything. They're sort of blind, like Mr. Magoo. And this turtle swims over to me, and it looks into my eyes and looks into the camera and goes, come on, honey. And I say, through my regulator, I say, not me, you fool, go over there. So I went over there. <laughs> that is just, it, this picture, this picture, I can look at it all day. Uh, the next... <laughs> The next couple of pictures are, are difficult to, to look at, and that's for a reason. You're making a beautiful image, but it's very important to you to make sure that you document the dark side of what's going on. 
with the ocean and with what we're doing to the ocean and what we're doing to creatures in the ocean. This is a dolphin slaughter in a place called Futo. It's a little town 60 miles south of Tokyo. The, uh, the villagers have driven 3,000 dolphins into the harbor, put a net across the mouth, and are slowly slaughtering them. The dolphins themselves are not eaten there, or even in Tokyo, they go south to Nagoya and Kobe. And uh, what they do is they pull the nets tighter, and as they pull the nets tighter, we can show you their pictures. Yeah. So How they, are you they cut the uh, carotid artery, and the dolphins begin to bleed to death. When I was making this picture, mm -hmm. I, could, I was standing on this uh, cement K, looking out at the scene, and I could feel the cries of the dolphins literally coming up from the soles of uh, my boots into my legs and up into my viscera. How were you allowed to be there? I can't imagine they were that pleased with you documenting what's going on. We had been working there uh, in Futo Harbor for about three months, and the villagers and the people there knew us very well and trusted us. These pictures were tough. They were pre-Cove pictures. There was a while before they would be published, and there still would be a tough one to publish right now. Uh, right now, they've basically stopped dolphin harvesting because they've harvested all the dolphins. Uh, times are changing, attitudes are changing, but this is one of the things that humans do to the ocean. This might sound like an obvious question, but I'm assuming through work like this, you you hope to have influence. And, and do you know of any examples where your work has influenced a situation? Uh, Alison, I think that the, the most important thing is that pictures have power. Uh, I'm a photojournalist. Jennifer and I are photojournalists in the sea. And what we want to tell you is this other world. To affect that kind of power, we have to make pictures that are beautiful and compelling. Uh, <coughs> what you would think about as conservation artistry it might be something because we have what do we have a millisecond to take to capture people's vision and here's another way we did it this is this was taken underwater correct this is an underwater picture and the creature is called a nudibranch they are snails without shells they are the most beautiful, colorful creature on Earth. Divers know about them, the rest of the world doesn't. They advertise the fact that they're very poisonous because they eat poisonous things like hydroids. In the longest running uh, uh, campaign, advertising campaign in the world, which is, this is how it goes. I am beautiful, eat me, and you will die. <laughs> uh, and we make a little box. I made a little underwater studio, it's this big little box with strobes and everything else, and we took it to the nudibranchs rather than bringing the nudibranchs to us. So no nudibranchs were harmed during this uh, story. But it was wildly popular. This one uh, became a, something called Pimp My Nudibranch. It became a website <laughs> for a moment. And nudibranchs also have hitchhikers. This is a little shrimp riding on one of them. Sometimes in your work, you, you take off your journalist hat and you create an environment underwater and you in this next picture probably the most creative use of Spanx ever. Gentlemen, do you know what Spanx are? They're sort of pantyhose girdles that ladies wear. Um, you could put the lead weights in them and a little bit of squid and it attracted all the stingrays around our model. And this was for a, a story on the uh, 2007 Milan collection that we put underwater. So this model, to be clear, has spanks full of squid and spanks lead? Spanks full of squid, yeah. <laughs> Was she frightened at all? No, she loved, she loved the uh, stingrays. Do and you the get, stingrays loved her. Do you get frightened at all? We do get frightened. We've had some, some uh, close calls in our lives. I, I, think, I think the most dangerous times in the sea are basically our own, are caused by our own stupidity and greed. It's the need for one more picture one more time, pushing the limits, pushing the time, trying to get these images, and especially in the digital age, because you see what you've got and you know what you can get more of. Uh, and there's a, there's a certain amount of uh, beauty that is so hypnotic, like this weedy sea dragon swimming through a kelp forest in uh, Tasmania. That's 
see it. He's pushing the button. I'm trying. I'm These trying. guys are about this long, and they look like wind-up toys. They eat tiny mice and shrimps. Can you help me out in advance, the next one? There we go. The most wonderful of all sea lions to swim with are Australian sea lions, and the, they're like uh, they're like the underwater equivalent of golden retrievers, and they come up and they they tickle your palms with their whiskers, and they look deeply into your face, and they uh, they're terrific. Take another shot at this next pair. There we go. This is, and we're on a little island. It's an island called Hopkins Island, not much bigger than this room. There's this small colony of them, and all of a sudden, instead of playing with you, they disappear. And there's a good reason for that, and that's this. Is there some place that you've wanted to go to explore that you haven't been able to, aside from this man, the shark's mouth? Well, what I don't want to do is drop the American Express card down the shark's mouth. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is uh, done by, this is a great white shark, incidentally, and it's uh, it's, uh, it's made with a, a camera called a pole camera. The camera's at the end of a pole. You don't want to put your head and shoulders into a shark's mouth. It's not a good idea. But has there been a place that you've not been able to get to or oh, it's been God. so elusive to you? Everything. That, you know, one thing after another. We, we want to go to Iceland. We want to look into, uh, look into the uh, uh, waters below the Pantanal in, in, uh, uh, in Brazil. We're going to uh, work later on in a project in the Sargasso Sea, a world which is going to be protected, a piece of ocean without fences or land. Uh, and we go from here to uh, New Guinea. And then after that, uh, we go to uh, Antarctic. A picture I made in, uh, this is a picture, I love this picture because you can see the breaking wave and this is at the edge of the Bahama Banks. Sharks in the Bahamas are now protected. As of 2011, the Bahamas have become a shark sanctuary. For the rest of the world, almost 90% of the population of sharks has been decimated for one reason only, and that's shark fin soup. And again, pictures have power. To tell people the grace and the beauty of these creatures may be a way to protect them. They're part of this uh, infinite food chain in the ocean, and without them, things begin to change radically. And you had mentioned to me that uh, a large corporation actually changed their policy. You, uh, like, for instance, Disney. Uh, Walt Disney and, and uh, Disney World in Hong Kong will not serve shark fin soup. Uh, Singapore is beginning to try and become a city-state that's shark fin soup free, though it's a battle. Here's a place that is a dream-like. Place. It's, a, it's a place called Raja Ampat, in the very uh, eastern, excuse me, western end of New Guinea. This is a great school of fish and fishermen uh, just at dusk fishing in the outrigger. We'll try to get to as many as we can. And of course, the Great Barrier Reef. Hold out your hand, you know, like this, and pretend it's an infant's hand, and you can see that an infant's pinky nail is a single coral polyp does all of this. Coral is another continent in our, in our, in our world. It's uh, another one you're concerned about as and well. Another, and another one that's radically, radically changing because of uh, global climate change and ocean acidification. This is not, incidentally, a picture of Jack Nicholson. It's a, uh, it's a sleeping parrotfish on the Great Barrier Reef. It's Nemo. Uh, Nemo. They're good parents. Uh, the male clownfish is aerating the eggs, which are about to hatch within, uh, within 24 hours. It's an extremely tender picture, too. I swam into a school of barracuda, and I realized I was being surrounded by them. And they form a perfect defensive circle. And I went back to the boat. I got the captain of the boat. We both swam back. They circled her, I dove to the bottom and looked up, and here's a circle, a piece of geometry in a place with no corners and no geometry. They went once, twice, three times around, and then they were gone. And I'll ask you our last question, because I know these images answer it. Why is this important? Why is this work you do important? This is our planet. The engine of our planet, the engine of our planet is the ocean. If I can bring you 
some pictures from the ocean, like Jennifer's picture, for instance, of a baby harp seal, the most beautiful creature in the world for 15 days, 14 days, uh, then we can make decisions that will affect our future and our lives. This is a picture she made of a, of a lesson that this baby harp seal, the mother is teaching the baby harp seal to swim. This is the first time it's been in the water. They have 14 days to learn to swim or they will drown. And they're like butter balls. They just can't seem to sink. But we were face to face. It was in our face the fact that the climate was changing. For the last two years on the ice in the middle of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the ice has failed and 100% of the pups drowned. This is because the ice is warmer and warmer and warmer. It is changing right before our eyes. And yet, this is a world that I just absolutely love. I encourage you to go to David's website and lose yourself for an afternoon. It's easy to do. David Dubelay, thank you so much.